welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. It is uh, my pleasure. Um, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Kevin Croston, the Associate Dean for Research at the Syracuse University School of Information Studies. And it is my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this research talk. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce my colleague, Jennifer stromer -Galley. Uh Jennifer is a professor in our school. She currently also serves as Senior Associate Dean, as well as uh, conducting an active research uh, program, so it's not clear when she sleeps. Uh, she was president of the Association of Internet Researchers uh, from 2015 to 2017, and she's been studying social media before it was even called social media, uh, studying online interaction and strategic communication in a variety of contexts, including political forums and online games. She has published over 50 journal articles, proceedings, and book chapters. Her award-winning book, Presidential Campaigning in the Internet Age, uh, gives a history of presidential campaigns as they have adopted and adapted to digital communication technologies. And today's talk follows in that uh, pattern. During the most recent presidential campaign, Professor stromer Galley and her team analyzed the candidates' Facebook advertisements, their messages, the tone, who was targeted, and how much was spent in ads. It's a project called Illuminating, and you can find a lot more detail on the website. Her talk today is based on this work, the steady drumbeat of election fraud during the 2020 presidential election, the role of Facebook advertising. So I'm delighted to uh, ask Jenny to uh, start her talk. Thank you, Kevin, um, for hosting this. And thanks everybody for taking a little time out of your busy days uh, to come and revisit the 2020 presidential election. Um, I wasn't sure anybody would wanna show up because, uh, I'm still traumatized. So today I'm gonna to talk with you um, about some research. I have to confess, this is really hot off the press um, and I'll explain a bit more why that's the case. So I'm still thinking about uh, this analysis and what it means. Um, and so maybe together we can think a little bit about what it is that is going on uh, with regard to Facebook advertisements by the campaigns. So the agenda today, um, I'll first give some context about the get out the vote efforts by political campaigns and why they matter. And the context that we came into in the 2020 presidential election in the United States. Um, I'll unpack campaign advertising on social media. And when I say social media, what I really mean here is Facebook and Instagram, because that's what we have data for. That's a challenge and an issue in and of itself, but that's the reality. Um, and if you hear me say Facebook, which I'll use a lot through this talk, what I really mean is Facebook and Instagram. So Facebook, the corporation that owns the, the platforms, Facebook and Instagram, that's what I'm talking about. Then I want to briefly give you uh, a touch of theoretical flavor. Um, I am an academic. I like academic terms. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, datification. So when you leave this talk today, you can um, feel assured that you got some good jargon to show off with your friends. And then I'll dive into some of what Trump's campaign was doing on Facebook around their get out the vote messaging and the extent to which it seems to have further contributed to the claims and concerns around election fraud in the United States um, after November 5th, whatever the election date was. And then we'll spend some time for questions. Um, one thing is uh, Kevin is watching the uh, uh, feed. And so if you have a question while I'm presenting, don't hesitate to type in that question. And if it makes sense uh, to interrupt, Kevin will do so. And I'll answer those kind of in the moment questions. Happy to do so. Yes, I should have uh, mentioned that. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, screen. And if you click on that, it will open up and uh, there's a place to type in your question. Yeah, um, I'm going to try to actually show you some videos of ads along the way, too. Um, and I'll check in to make sure that sounds and works OK as we go. All right, so let's go back in time, shall we, to just a few, actually about a year ago, um, to the 2020 presidential election. Um, so I, I want to underscore, and maybe it seems obvious, but elections at the end of the day are about the vote. Campaigning, all of that effort, all of that money, all of the travel and the discussion and angst and polarization that occurs around political elections these days is in service of 
getting people to come to a polling place on a given day and time to cast a ballot for their party, for their candidates, um, from president all the way down. And that's, that's, it's important to keep that in mind because campaigns spend a lot of their effort trying to identify who to mobilize to turn out to vote on election day. That's really what campaigning is about. Now, that was complicated in the 2000 presidential election. It is actually about this time last year that the nation began to realize that we were facing a global pandemic. It also happened to coincide with the presidential primaries. The states, each state in the United States takes a turn or together over a series of, of um, days, they elect their nominees for the party to serve um, in a contest for the general election for who will become president. You might remember Wisconsin was one of the early states. Um, Wisconsin's primary was uh, in uh, April, scheduled for April 6. And in the month of March, there were uh, legal contests about whether Wisconsin would still hold an in-person primary or if they would shift to absentee or vote by mail um, balloting for the primary candidates or maybe postpone the vote to a later date because maybe the virus would be less virulent later. Um, a event, <laughs> hindsight 2020. So Wisconsin um, highlighted that debate that occurred. And you might remember that in Wisconsin, the Republicans were able to block a democratic effort to uh, either shift to absentee or change the date of the vote. And so Wisconsin showed up en masse to vote, long lines, uh, leading to questions about how safe would in-person voting be? So while Wisconsin was having this very public legal fight about whether people needed to show up to vote in person at a polling place, other states made a number of changes to their voting um, regulations to make it easier for people to vote, um, and that included shifting to mail-in balloting. And mail-in balloting took on different dimensions, everything from states sending applications to registered voters to states sending ballots to registered voters so that they could then return those ballots. Other states like New York made it easier for voters to get absentee ballots um, so that you didn't necessarily have to have a reason to get an absentee ballot, or in some states, you didn't have to have a second um, uh, uh, signatory on your absentee ballot. Some states allowed for ballot drop-off boxes, and um, uh, these efforts all were trying to make it simpler, easier for voters who had health concerns and did not want to go to a physical polling place to be able to vote when it was their time to do so. Now, President Trump, in um, uh, starting in March, began to raise questions about mail-in balloting. In April, he uh, tweeted a number of false claims about balloting and mail-in balloting. So for example, this tweet, Republicans should fight very hard when it comes to statewide mail-in voting. Democrats are clamoring for it tremendous potential for voter fraud, and for whatever reason, doesn't work out well for Republicans. Or this tweet on April 12th, mail-in ballots substantially increased the risk of crime and voter fraud. In March, um, sorry, that's not true, in May, um, Michigan and Nevada and California all were looking at um, mail-in voting and making changes to the vote, allowing people to do mail-in balloting rather than having to go to polling places. And again, Trump uh, tweeted out a number of false claims in May about the risks of voter fraud with these mail-in ballot scenarios. So this tweet on May 26 on your left, there is no way, zero, that mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. Interestingly, on television, 
in May, uh, Trump ran a large ad buy on TV that focused not on these questions of mail-in ballots and ballot fraud, but instead on Biden's um, sort of ability to lead. This um, ad ran uh, in a number of states and it basically questioned whether or not Biden was competent to serve as president. Interestingly, about the same time that this, this TV ad began to run in May, um, the uh, Trump campaign bought a fairly large ad buy on Facebook. This particular ad buy, as you can see from the text, basically declares that Democrats are stealing the most important election of our lives and uh, stating that uh, Democrats are stuffing the ballot box with fake and fraudulent votes. So what I wanna talk a little bit more about is what was happening on social media around the presidential uh, campaign for the, Trump, uh, for the Trump campaign. So let me unpack social media advertising. I'm gonna go uh, fairly quickly through this um, if you have any questions, this is a good place to, to say, wait, 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 what? Um, but I wanna give you a kind of an understanding of how it is that social media advertising works and why it's so important. So if you had a pulse in 2020 and you used Facebook, Instagram, Google, you likely were exposed, or YouTube, especially YouTube, you likely were exposed to social media advertisements by political campaigns, whether it was the presidential campaigns or political action committees, they were everywhere. Our analysis, so my research team and I, in looking at the social media messaging by the presidential candidates, we estimate that about $160 million was spent on Facebook and Instagram between June and November first. Um, that is unprecedented amounts of money. Uh, by contrast, in uh, 2016, it was about 40 million. Now, that 160 million or whatever I just said that was spent on um, uh, Facebook and Instagram advertisements was only about 40% of the total amount of all ad spending by the political campaigns television advertisements actually make up the bulk of ad spending by political campaigns. And that's because TV ads are expensive. When a campaign runs a television advertisement, they're not buying to a person, they're buying to a region. If you live in Boston, you it's a big community and it touches not only Boston, but also parts of Massachusetts, sorry, New Hampshire. And so it's a big expensive media market. And that is part of the reason, whereas Facebook, because it's targeted, and I'll talk more about that in a second, is much less expensive because you're reaching fewer people, but it's more efficient. Our estimates suggest that there were over 200,000 ads run on Facebook by Biden and Trump. And that's just their main pages. And I can unpack more details about that. But just the, the official Biden and Trump campaign pages on Facebook, 200,000 ads. That's a lot of advertisements. All right, so why? Why are campaigns spending all of this money on Facebook advertising? Well, it has to do with Facebook's algorithms that make predictions about who you are as a user of the platform and the kinds of interests and hobbies and uh, network of friends and things that you say on a daily basis. All of this activity that you are doing on the platform, Facebook and Instagram, ends up being fed into algorithms that predict who you are as a person. Now, not really. What it's really doing is making predictions of what the algorithm thinks you are based on how you use the platform, um, whether or not that's accurate. You get sort of, um, uh, de-individuated. That is your likes, your interests, your habits. They may not really reflect who you actually are, but the algorithm is making these predictions based on what you're doing and saying. And so you, you yourself, this whole rich person with family and friends, etc., yet basically created a, um, a, a structured in a database as a series of uh, activities and interests, some of which may be true, some of which may not be. 
But the power for Facebook and the power for the political campaigns um, in using, so the power for Facebook is of course they can sell this prediction about you to advertisers. The power for the advertisers is then they hope that they can find that needle in a haystack as Brad Parscale said, who was Trump, Trump's digital director in 2016. So I'll take a concrete example. Here in the city of Syracuse, most Syracuse residents who are registered voters register with the Democratic Party. But there are Republicans who live in the city of Syracuse. And so the power of Facebook is that if the Trump campaign wanted to target Republican voters in Syracuse, rather than doing a television ad buy, where now they're advertising mostly to Democrats, which is inefficient, they can run an ad targeted at Republicans or who they who Facebook says these people are likely Republicans, and then you can find that Republican needle in the haystack. So where does Facebook, sorry, let me back up, where do the campaigns get all of this information to make a prediction about who a voter might be? So again, Facebook is making predictions, but the campaigns are making predictions as well about who you are, what your interests are, if you're likely aligned with the political party or not. So I won't unpack this at length, and I need to give credit to Aitan Hirsch um, and Hacking the Electorate for unpacking where campaigns get their data. It starts with voter registration data. If you're registered to vote, campaigns want to know that because you're somebody that they can actually get to vote on election day. If you're not registered to vote, then it's harder for campaigns because now they have to figure out how to get you registered. They have to find you, get you registered, and then try to get you to the polls. It's a much harder lift, much easier to go ahead, find those people who are already registered, find who are the Republicans, who are the Democrats, target those on your party, and get them to vote on election day. Now, Voter registration is key. In many states, you indicate what your party identification is. And so for campaigns, they're good. They know this. But there are states where actually party ID is not part of the voter registration form. When that happens, the parties need to gather additional information to make predictions about if you're a Democrat or a Republican or none of the above. So public records, if you are a police officer, if you are a teacher, if you are a beautician, you need to get licensed in your state. That is public records. That information is valuable to political campaigns because it helps them then identify likely Republicans based on that, uh, um, that profession. And then I'll go all the way to the right here for the internet. So layering in then all this different sorts of, of data, now we have the interests and habits that people undertake as they use the internet. All that gets layered into these databases that the campaigns then use to make predictions of who it is that they want to target on Facebook. So now I want to talk a little bit about Facebook's uh, advertising offerings so that you can get a sense of the different ways that, that Facebook makes itself useful to advertisers like, say, Donald Trump's campaign. The most common ways that the campaigns use Facebook for advertising is the custom audience. Basically, what that means is if the Trump campaign wants to target men who are licensed as police officers, again, using the FOIA freedom of information requests from states, they can get data about who are licensed police officers in those states. And they can build that campaign list then of known police officers. They then pass that list to Facebook. And Facebook matches that list from the campaign to, to Facebook users, either on name, email address, or other personally identifying information. Those people who are matches then get the advertisement that the campaign wants to go to men who are licensed as police officers. I should note that Facebook never ever sends back to the Trump campaign that matched with Facebook list. What the campaign gets to know is a percentage of how much of their campaign list actually matches. So 20%, 40% of, the, of the, the lists are matched, but they don't actually know who the matches are. You'll notice that the campaign ads always on Facebook and Instagram have a hyperlink so that if you click and engage with the ad, you will then go back to a website. The very first thing the website is going to ask for is your email address. So campaigns create a feedback loop through their advertisements to get your email address, they hope, because then that further gives them confirmation of who actually on that campaign list 
was activated by that advertisement. Then there are the interest audiences. And in my talk it, a little bit later, I'm going to talk more about these interest audiences. So basically, um, let's say that, that Trump wants to target people who are interested in gun rights. So they have, um, they'll basically just go to Facebook and say, we want to target people who are interested in gun rights. And Facebook will actually help them identify keywords or interest names that might be good matches for people who are interested in gun rights. So for example, it might be uh, somebody who follows the NRA Facebook page or somebody who on their um, Facebook wall under interest indicates gun rights or conceal and carry or the second amendment. So those things that are kind of keywords almost um, that are matches of interest between what the campaign wants and what Facebook has predicted users' interests are based on how they use the platform. Those matches then are then given the advertisement. And then there's the third, which are lookalike ads. Now, this is fascinating. So basically, let's say the target is people who look like law enforcement. So again, let's say the Trump campaign really is going after people in law enforcement. They've built up a list of people that they know are in law enforcement. So police officers, security, maybe a sergeant, somebody who's part of ICE, uh, maybe somebody doing corrections. So they pass that campaign list to Facebook and they say, hey, Facebook, we know these people all are affiliated with law enforcement. Use your creative algorithms to see if you can figure out what the, the sort of features or profiles are of these people. And then those people who look like our list of law enforcement, we want those people to get our ads. And so you can see here, this is my exemplar example. You'll notice that some of the people that might be lookalikes aren't actually matches. So you'll notice that one's an immigrant, one's a student, one's a professor. And so those folks aren't actually in law enforcement, but for some reason, some aspect of what they're doing on Facebook makes them look as if they are law enforcement. So then they get targeted the ad. This is less efficient, but part of why campaigns love this is it potentially surfaces new um, interested uh, voters um, through this mechanism. Okay, so datafication, back to the, the um, 10,000, or what's the $50 words, 50 cent words? I don't know, whatever, let me give you some. So datafication is this idea that voters are being segmented into not only party, and voter uh, turnout, that is, campaigns wanna know two things. Are you part of our party and do you turn out to vote? And those have been the key variables. But now with all of this additional data, campaigns can begin to further nuance or datafy their targeting to particular segments of the public based on their interests, their affiliations, and their engagement levels. So in other words, the voters are de-individuated. We are broken into these um, fields and databases of interests that then are used um, to make predictions about whether you should get an ad or not. And for the party, that means, or for the part of the campaigns, it means that voters are fragmented, de-individuated, which allows the campaigns, they hope, to really target more effectively uh, people and ultimately, at the end of the day, win the election. And that's part of the argument that's in the book, which is why the picture of the book is in. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking about Trump's advertisements uh, that he ran on Facebook during the, the end of the primary the general election. Um, I need to give you a couple of sources so you know where my information is coming from. The first is the Illuminating Project. So Illuminating is um, uh, the love of my life. Um, and there's a big team of people who helped me uh, with this project. You can visit the website. The URL is illuminating.ischool.syr.edu, and you can play with the data yourself. We basically are accessing Facebook's ad library API. What that means is that there is a doorway between our servers at Syracuse University and Facebook as we, we are an approved, um, uh, we have a data licensing agreement, which means that Facebook is giving us access um, to the Facebook ad library to then um, analyze the ads that ran during the general election and the primaries um, by the presidential campaigns. In addition, just this week, we got a hold of this data set. Uh, Facebook announced in January that they were going to release to academics who have data licensing agreements a special 
um, set of data that allows us to see more detailed fine-grained micro-targeting. The Facebook ad library and API only provides information about the state, for example, that a target ad was run in, and some generic, or not generic, but some more broader categories like age and gender, but on a few categories um, in terms of targeting. This new data set of micro-targeting data allows us to see what interests the campaigns were searching for in their advertising. It also provided more fine-grained detail about location, geographical location of who was being targeted in the advertisements. So that's why this, this analysis is really um, first blush because we just started playing with this data. It's a complicated, messy data set. So, um, so bear with me, here we go. All right, let's talk about Trump. So remember, as I mentioned to you, May 2020, while Trump's advertisements were talking about Biden on television, on Facebook, this ad uh, was running. And it was a national ad buy. It ran in, in most of the states. And relatively speaking, it was a large ad buy. Now, you might say $28,000. That's nothing, especially when you think about how expensive a television ad is. But $28,000 on Facebook buys you a lot of impressions. So this was a very large ad buy. Um, and I just provide here on the right, here's some demographic information. This is summarized actually from the ad library. This is not our analysis, but you can see it's a pretty even spread. Like they were scattering far and wide this particular advertisement to the public. Then in August, this ad ran, and I'm gonna try to show you or play the audio because it matters a lot to the context that I want to share with you. So give me one second to jump over. And I'm going to hit play and hey, Florida, I'm Laura Trump, and I want to make sure you know about absentee voting or what Floridians refer to as vote by mail. My father in law, President Trump, has always supported absentee voting with safeguards in place. We want you to know there is a difference between the Democrat imposed vote by mail system and the vote by mail system that you have in Florida. In Florida, you as a voter must both register and request your absentee ballot. This is very different and much more secure a process than when the Democrats mail everyone in a state a ballot, often resulting in ballots being mailed to abandoned addresses and hmm, individuals not registered to vote. With this in mind, if you have cast your ballot by mail in the past, or if you were planning to do so for this very imperative November election, you can visit vote.donaldjtrump.com to verify that you're registered to vote and learn how to obtain your absentee ballot. All right, so I'll stop that there. So you might have caught a couple of things um, from that. Uh, the underscoring that Democrats would be sending in sending ballots out to everybody in the state, including to abandoned homes and people hmm, who are not registered to vote. Now again, not true. Let me be very clear. That claim is not true, but that was reinforced in this advertisement. Worth noting that this ad only aired in Florida. Um, this, the buy was fairly large, $13,000, and had between 350 and 500,000 impressions in, in Florida. Now, I asked myself, why Florida? Why just run this ad in Florida? And I think, and I don't have all the answers. I think some of it is because uh, Florida is, was a very important state to Donald Trump. He needed to win Florida. He, I think because Mar-a-Lago is his second home, I think he also felt some connection to Florida, wanted to really make sure he won that as, in effect, his home state. But also, it is a state with a lot of older voters who probably didn't really want to go stand in line to vote at a polling place, would much rather vote absentee. And so because on the one hand, the Trump campaign in their press statements on Twitter, Trump was reinforcing this idea that mail-in ballots were fraudulent, would uh, be deeply problematic to his election win. He had to counter his campaign, really, had to counter that message by directly targeting potential Republican voters to say, yeah, I know we're talking about mail-in balloting being bad, but let's be clear here. We're not talking about 
absentee balloting where people have to go and register and get their absentee ballot. We're, we're just talking about that. And it's really, really important that you do that. In other words, the Trump campaign had to counter their public message with these targeted ads to Republican voters to reinforce the message that it was okay actually to vote absentee because if they didn't, there was concern that they would lose those voters. They just wouldn't turn out to vote on election day. So also in August, um, a similar ad ran, again, you'll notice as a slightly different tagline, get your absentee ballot application today. We need to vote to save our country. Absentee ballots are good. I need you to get your application and send in your absentee ballot immediately. So let me, uh, Jenny, show you this. there was a, yeah, a question that came up and uh, seeing August uh, prompts me to ask it now. Did, have you uh, gotten to the point where you can see differences in the campaign strategy with the change in the uh, ad director you quoted, Brad uh, Parscale? Or you're not at that level yet uh, of the analysis? We are not at that level yet. It's an interesting point because, right, Parscale's was fired in, I think, I, at the end of July, if I'm not serves. Um, there is a change in tone in the advertising, just my skim of it, but it's, it's early days. It's a great question. Thanks actually for bringing it up. Um, so let me share with you this ad because it's, it's also kind of interesting. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it to the polls to vote in the Florida primary. I have some very, very strong opinions in the primary, but even stronger on November 3rd. You know what we're going to do? Make America great again. That's what we have to do. We have no choice. We have to save our country so i'm signing today an absentee ballot absentee ballots are not universal mail-ins these are really good you have to work to get them and you have to make sure everything's perfect and you send them in and very little can go wrong so absentee ballots are good universal mail-ins when you get inundated with these things are bad and will lead to terrible things including voter fraud etc but absentee is good so get your application, send in your absentee ballots immediately. All right, so I'll stop that there. Thank so, you. Oops, sorry. So again, underscoring that absentee ballots are good, mail-in ballots are bad. Now for most voters, that's kind of confusing. Like it's one and the same really, because you're mailing it in whether, <laughs> both mechanisms are being mailed. But nevertheless, this was the, the messaging that the Trump campaign was working on. Um, I want to go back. I forgot to mention one thing. And I, hold on, I can't talk and click buttons at the same time. One sec. I just want to make sure I'm clicking the right button. So that the ad that showed Laura Trump, I just want to mention that when looking at the micro-targeting data, the campaign had uh, custom audiences for that. So they knew who they wanted to talk to in that ad buy in Florida. So they had predetermined lists of, of voters they'd already identified they then targeted those ads, that ad, the Laura Trump ad to those voters. This particular ad buy um, just ran for a couple of days, but it was a big buy. There were 3,200 different um, uh, buys on this. In other words, different segments of the, the voter um, uh, targets were sent sometimes little variants of this or different populations the campaign was trying to reach out to. So each buy, um, led, led to a kind of different ad um, representation in the database. Also only Florida, <clears throat> but unlike the Laura Trump ad, this one was a mix of both custom audiences where the campaign had a predetermined list they wanted to target, but it also included some interests. So some of those interests included uh, people who were in the military, so employed in the military, um, as well as um, people who are following different news, right-wing news shows like Rush Limbaugh, um, Sean Hannity, and Coulter. And there also were some, uh, as I mentioned, the, the custom audiences. But this was a big buy. So also at the end of August, the Trump campaign ran a large number of small buys on this new ad campaign called Promises Made, Promises Kept. Um, and there, are, there were about seven or eight variants of this. They ran for a couple of days, basically doing what's called A-B testing. So trying out different um, 
uh, images, you can see these images and videos to, and to different targets to see which ones resonated the most and then running those as much bigger buys um, to a larger audience. So this, from our analysis, is one of Trump's biggest ad buys during the general election period. It was over a $2 million ad buy. Um, so we're over 7,800 different variants of this ad targeted to different segments around the country. It ran from August 6, 26 to October 23rd. So basically the entire general election period. It, it definitely had a bunch of custom audience targets. We don't have access to those custom audiences. So I don't know what they look like. But on the interest side, some very intriguing things showed up. So some of the targets were people who identified as employment being in small business, being entrepreneurs or running a small business, the similar kind of right-wing media uh, as the prior ad that I mentioned, but then also sports. And I'm just including here a couple of examples. There are tons of them, uh, different kind of keywords, but things like volleyball, college basketball, volleyball. I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, and then a number of issues, including Second Amendment. What's noteworthy to me is the issues not there. So pro-life um, issues, environmental issues, um, taxes, uh, immigration, none of those things were, were targeted as issues, but gun rights and Second Amendment was. But there were a number of outdoor um, interests like hunting, fishing, um, and other outdoor activities were targets as well. And Florida politicians like Marco Rubio and um, Trey Gowdy, who else isn't a politician, but nevertheless, kind of Floridians that were known were part of this target as well. But again, you'll notice here that the underscoring messaging that, um, that you know, vote for President Trump is vote to save America, request your ballot. So, so Jenny, night, these are, yeah, um, you mentioned before that your data are both Facebook and Instagram. Do you distinguish between those at all or is it so for the moment, what's noteworthy is that these ads tend to run on both Facebook and Instagram. So before we got the micro-targeting data, um, if you go to the illuminating site, um, you'll notice that we don't actually allow you to toggle to see Facebook versus Instagram. The reason for that is almost all ads were targeted on both platforms. That's puzzling to me. I don't quite know how true that is. We are completely beholden by the accuracy of Facebook's databases. Um, so it's a little hard to say for sure, but at the moment, my statement to you is that it seems that most of the ads that I'm showing you were on both platforms. And again, this is just the uh, official campaign ads. Do you, is Facebook releasing ads from third parties like PACs? So um, the political action committee space is very, very challenging. Um, they are, and we can. Um, we've started some of that work. Uh, we meant to do it during the election while it was happening, but because the political action committees aren't known in advance and they, they register pages that then they run ads on, those pages may or may not align with the name of the political action committee. So there's a lot of sleuthing that you need to do in order to identify who the political action committees are what pages they're running, then you can get access to the ads if they were running ads. So there is absolutely more work to be done there. Um, I'll be honest, we haven't even looked to see if the micro-targeting data includes political action committees. So I don't know yet. We're just looking at the official campaign uh, pages at the moment, um, but there are a number of those, especially in the final days of the general election. This is just the, and you'll notice there at the top, it says Donald J. Trump for president. That's the page I'm currently looking through. There's more work to be done. So the 160 million is just uh, the Trump and Biden campaigns themselves. That's correct. All right. So last night, as I was digging into this um, this large number of ad buys, one of the things I noticed is that the promises made, promises kept. You'll notice there's that image down here at the bottom. The text for this promises made, promises kept doesn't change. So over that 7,800 ad buys, the text is the same. However, there are many variants of images and videos that are part of this ad, um, ad campaign. And so while I was digging around last night, I found uh, a, a kind of noteworthy ad and I did a little bit of sleuthing. So you might recall that at the end of August um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, there were, a num there were multiple days of protests around the shooting of Jacob Blake by police. On the third night of protests, a young man who police mistook for being a police officer shot two protesters and killed them. 
So that happened right at the end of August. This ad, and I'm gonna show it to you guys in a minute, um, aired in Wisconsin only, September 7th and September 8th. And it caught my eye. And let me show it to you. One second to push some buttons again. All right. So the visual is meet Joe Biden supporters. I've seen this before. I've skimmed past this. I didn't even think to click on it. But last night I was like, hmm, I wonder what that is. So I clicked on it. This is a movement, I'm telling you. They're not gonna stop. Sorry, one second. And they should not. These people are scared of our last <laughs> Third straight night, the police declared a riot. The vast majority of the protests have been peaceful. Over the weekend, 59 officers injured and 47 people arrested. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announcing a proposal to cut a billion dollars from the New York City Police Department. We need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Won't be safe in Joe Biden's <laughs> Probably should have warned you guys. Um, that's uh, a bit, it's a bit violent um, and not, uh, I'm not even sure what to say about that. So that ad, um, again, aired in Wisconsin, only in Wisconsin, targeted mostly at men and most interesting to Interestingly to me, it's a custom audience. So Trump's campaign knew who they wanted to target with this ad, only aired in Wisconsin and played on, I think, uh, for at least the target audience, the anger and frustration and perhaps even kind of racist fears that were being felt um, by uh, segments of Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin voters, probably, I'm guessing, um, around the process happening uh, in Kenosha and in other major cities like Milwaukee. And, um, and so this ad, um, again, not really so much about balloting, but is underscoring some of the challenges here with looking at these political advertisements um, when uh, the video content um, can actually produce a very different message potentially from what the text is providing. And it's hard to see and hard to study. Okay, so back to balloting um, and absentee balloting. So then in October, there are a number of small ad buys again on this theme. And in the interest of time, I won't show these to you, but the, um, this, these are uh, Trump supporters at Trump events. And again, this is October in the heart of the, ad, of the global pandemic. Um, nobody's masked or anything. They're there at this rally. Um, they identified mostly um, immigrants. Um, so the guy on the right is Ukrainian. The woman on the left is, um, she self-identifies as Latina. There's uh, another couple of ads that include other Latina women and there is an ad with a black man and an ad with a black woman. And all of them are talking about how important Trump is. And they're very unfiltered, very, sort of unscripted, authentic people speaking their love for Trump in these advertisements. So there were seriously small buys. And you'll notice that they continue to underscore the statement that we need to save our country, that absentee ballots are good with the underlying statement from these prior ads that I talked with you about that mail-in ballots are potentially bad. Um, so these ads ran in uh, some of the key swing states like Florida and Wisconsin and interestingly Maine's second district, which you might remember Maine got split um, and there was a lot of effort by the Trump campaign uh, to target Maine second. We guessed as much, but we now have this micro targeting data to see that that's true. Now, the Trump campaign did have a number of um, custom audiences that they were targeting, but they also were using Facebook's predicted interests, including small business and entrepreneurship and the right-wing media uh, ecosystem. Also in October, these uh, ads began to run. These underscore the need to request your ballot and the time is running out. And like the ad on the right, it's 
and this is a very large ad buy, it shows you Donald Trump's signature and it says vote like President Trump, again, echoing this idea that Trump voted absentee, he didn't vote by mail, and he's, he followed all of the processes to make sure it wasn't a fraudulent vote. The Trump campaign also kept underscoring that if you went to their website to get your ballot from the Trump campaign, it would therefore then be secure, which I find kind of an interesting argument. This was an entirely swing state ad buy. They did not run this ad in states like New York, which were not a swing state. They ran them in Pennsylvania, Ohio, et cetera. And again, targeting the, the usual suspects, um, but then also some interesting targets. Uh, state focused sports were in the list. Now we start to see some pro-life as well as gun related issues. And interestingly, other media like PBS and MSNBC. So people who identified on Facebook or Facebook identified them as being interested in Facebook, and sorry, that's weird, interested in PBS or MSNBC they also were targeted with this advertisement. And I think that's Trump campaign's effort to try to broaden their reach a little bit in the closing days of the election to try to hopefully activate more moderates in some of the districts they needed to secure um, the uh, election. So what does this mean? What is the total up to? I don't know, I'm still looking, but here's what I can tell you so far. So it is pretty clear in looking at the advertisements that Trump's campaign was actively working of course, on the national stage to sow doubt about the voting process in speeches and on Twitter, but in their TV, sorry, their Facebook advertisements, they had to nuance that attack because they didn't want to undermine the necessity of getting people to actually turn in a ballot for the candidate on election day. So it was a more nuanced argument um, and a bit challenging in some ways. The campaign's messaging, this is an, a, a problem from an analysis point of view. As I said to you guys, we can see the text very easily in these, um, in our analysis, in the databases that we've been given from Facebook, but there is no transcript, no text, no way to know what the video content or even the images are in the databases that we get from Facebook. So we need to do um, more work um, as researchers to then actually look at and analyze the video content, as I mentioned, Trump's ad buy that one was that one was huge, but many same text, many different videos, and so there's some questions there about problematic content and micro targeting that needs more analysis. And I guess finally, this is always my concern: as voters become more datafied and de-individuated, um, what does that mean for us as a society, as a democracy? when what we're being marketed to and our interests might speak to our lesser instincts, our base motives, our emotions, and could then lead to some of the further polarization and fractionization that we currently see in the United States. And it's not just here. So with that, I have two last things. I have to acknowledge my amazing team. So while I get the honor and opportunity to share the love of this project with you all, um, there is a huge group of people behind me and I couldn't do this, this project um, without them. So there's that. And again, you can go to illuminating.ischool.syr.edu to play with the, some of the data, not the micro-targeting data that's on the site yet, but um, the other analyses we've been doing so far. And with that, I'll stop and see if there are questions with the time that's remaining. Yes, we have uh, several uh, questions. Um, uh, one, maybe to get started, uh, you focused on the uh, Trump campaign. Um, have you had a chance to look at this point at the uh, Biden uh, spending? Um, yeah, so uh, I started last night. Um, I couldn't have fit Biden into this talk. That we'll have to do the second talk or something. But yes, I've started to look at Biden. A um, couple things that I noticed just quickly is that the Biden campaigns um, was actually, they were running ads responding to the Trump campaign's claims about voter fraud by underscoring that mail-in balloting was perfectly valid and not subject to fraud. Um, I think that my hunch is the Biden campaign was worried that the Trump campaign's continual drumbeat of questions about mail-in balloting would also suppress Democrat voters from 
sending in their ballots or getting absentee ballots. So they had to do some counter messaging on that front. And of course they used it to further um, sort of attack and demean Trump at the same time um, by uh, those <clears throat> allegations of his soundness to be president. So, so in other words, uh, the Biden campaign is doing the same kind of micro-targeting strategies. Uh, oh yes. And, oh, and yes. sometimes doing it in response to the, but <clears throat> at the time of the election, uh, they can see the ads, but they actually can't see the targeting, right? That's so right. that must make it very challenging to know where and how you need to respond. Yeah, for sure. So they can see, like we could see on the Facebook ad library's website, who the targets were, but the target is only at the state level. And again, it's a couple of categories, it's five categories on age, a couple of categories on, on gender, and that's it. Um, and that's intentional. Facebook said they didn't want to their advertisers don't want that secret sauce to be shared because it is a kind of a secret sauce. But for sure, the Biden campaign was in, in undertaking the same kind of micro-targeting. It seems that there was, if you will, response happening by the Biden campaign, maybe also by the Trump campaign back and forth through their micro-targeting, but they're making guesses um, about who should get those ads. Yeah. Um, and I guess um, another uh, concern about that <clears throat> is that, um, you have the data about the uh, campaigns, but presumably there's a lot going on with the uh, the supposedly independent PACs, but who may be uh, doing something in coordination and, and in particular trying to undermine the strategies of the campaigns, the opposing campaigns. Absolutely right. So there's um, there, that, that whole ecosystem of, of the political action campaigns um, is the next nut that we need to crack. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, it does, a uh, comment from one of the listeners is, it seems that the Trump campaign ads, the ones that you showed, were more civil and less clickbaity than the ads posted by some of the other groups uh, and those ads that went viral. But I guess that's not a focus of the current analysis. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, right? So it is very much the case that the campaign wants, if, they, if you see an ad on your Facebook wall, the campaign really wants you to click on that ad. That's why they always have a hyperlink um, because that engagement data and if you get email address is huge for the campaigns. So um, if they're less clickbaity, it's because the campaign's not doing a good job or because you're not the target, right? And that's, I think, something to keep in mind. It might not be the target, so it doesn't speak to you in the same kind of way. The other thing to mention is remember when you're on Facebook or Instagram and you're scrolling through the feed and, and you're, you're, as you scroll, you, your scroller stops on a video, that video will start to roll and all of the videos are captioned. So even if you're not um, listening to it, you can still see the text. And so that's something that, that complicates those feelings about clickbaitness because it's possible that those videos and elements of those videos are calling and engaging certain targets in, um, in compelling ways. In other words, it's hard to tell what is and is not clickbaity. And we don't, we do get some impression data. So we do have some sense of that, but that gets very challenging to look at because again, they do these small ad buys on an ad campaign. Um, and so you have to aggregate all of those to then get a sense of whether or not a particular ad buy was, was in fact really engaging. And we've got some analysis of that on the website. You can take a look at it. Does uh, Facebook allow you to target by religion? Yes. And so, is there evidence um, in it, the data set of that? Yes. Um, one of the ads that I, um, and I, I got distracted, so I didn't share it, but it's the, um, the promises made, promises kept. That ad buy did also target uh, religious groups. And it, it was everything from Seventh-day Adventists to the Catholic Church to Methodists. Um, to some like uh, Christian rock groups. So it was a very broad spectrum um, of, of religions. I've got to look at that more and see um, if different ad buys targeted different religious interests, that's still to be determined. So uh, would you agree, uh, one of the posters asks with uh, Ellen Weintraub about ending micro-targeting. Um, how do you think that would, is that actually feasible? Is that something that Facebook's um, new uh, oversight board might uh, try to impose. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, do you think it's likely? And secondly, uh, I guess, what kind of impact would that have? Yeah, it's a really, really important question. So um, 
you know, Twitter decided to not run any political advertisements on the platform in 2020. And um, they walked away from a very large, potentially relatively large amount of money. Again, $160 million just from June to November in political advertisements. And that's just the main Trump and Biden pages. That's not the entire ecosystem of money that was spent on the election. It's hard for me to imagine Facebook as a company walking away from that revenue, um, not without significant pressure uh, from Congress and from the public to say enough. It's also worth mentioning that the political parties, the political action committees, the political organizations and interest groups, they want this micro-targeting because it's effective. It helps them find that needle in a haystack, those supporters that are otherwise really hard to activate and mobilize. Um, and so they want it too. So you have the, these kind of counter pressures of the market and capitalist forces like a for-profit company like Facebook that are coming up against um, questions about what's healthy for our democracy and um, what do we need to have in order to make good decisions about to whom we vote. So um, I am a, I'm a social scientist. Um, I don't always think about these policy questions. I am starting to think about them more, but at the moment, I don't know. How's that for a terrible answer? Um, so a few other questions. What, um, you mentioned that uh, <clears throat> the text uh, stays the same, but the uh, images change. Is there any attempt, if, you know, if we leave aside the micro-targeting, uh, are there efforts about uh, regulating the content? There should be. Um, so I think there, the, um, our political establishment has shirked their duties, from my perspective, in really fully, thoroughly um, considering how best to regulate the speech that occurs on these platforms. You know, it's sticky though. You're talking about potential First Amendment um, uh, complications. Uh, we have a Supreme Court that has ruled that uh, much um, of this political speech is protected speech, including corporations when they run advertisements right. on the- But um, Facebook is not the government. Facebook is a no. private corporation. Yes. Well, so there's there's two pieces there, right? So the, the government could be, and they have regulated television advertisements and what should and what can and cannot be said, if you will, on TV ads and put some onus on uh, broadcasters to regulate the content of advertisements on television. There has been the same sort of conversation about whether and to what extent that needs to happen on the platforms. Um, so there's the government discussion about regulation. Then there's also the platforms discussion. And you know, these companies are talking about what their roles and obligations are. They are, they are challenged because they are for-profit organizations. They have um, shareholders and um, businesses that they need to support. So, but they also are currently our, um, increasingly our public square and the commons where we learn about politics and um, gain uh, the kind of information and theory that we need to make good decisions. And so will these platforms be good citizens? Um, what role will they play? I don't know. I think these, the next two years will be interesting to watch for those kinds of conversations. Um, so maybe one or two uh, questions just to finish. So does your data set include people other than the uh, two main parties, um, third party candidates, for example? It does. Um, yeah, so you can get the, the Libertarian, um, the Green Party candidates, um, the third party candidates, and the down ballot candidates are there as well. Wow, that's a real uh, trove. Yes. Um, and maybe final question. Um, do you have any way of assessing what kind of impact these ads actually have on the people who get targeted? It's such a good question. It's the one that I've been mulling the most um, and very challenging to do post, -net, post hoc. Um, interestingly, Facebook actually funded a large number of academics to do research during the general election um, to measure potentially impact. Um, and so uh, um, that so th those would be some of the folks to watch. I was not one of those. Um, that's a longer political story I won't get into right now. Um, you know, there are things you can do. So for example, with the micro-targeting data, although it turns out it's not as, as micro as I was hoping for, um, but you could do things like look at turnout. So it is possible to get turnout rates and numbers. Um, and also you can actually get 
you can get from secretaries of state who actually voted. Now you don't know how they voted, but you can find out if they actually went to a polling place or cast a ballot on election day. And so it is possible to do some marrying up of, of our data sets with turnout data, challenging, um, complicated, hard work because you have to go to each secretary of state and you gotta convince them to give you the data, but that's potentially a route. Another is doing surveys, but the election's over. So it's hard to do surveys, you know, almost six months to a year out and say, hey, did that ad have an effect on you? Um, there's a third route, which we'll be doing some experimentation with, I think this summer, which is actually taking some of these ads and um, doing some experiments to see how people respond and react to the ads and how it shapes and changes attitudes. So um, the effect question is real and it's hard, unfortunately. And I think uh, that's probably the way that uh, most research presentations end with a call for further research. So we're out of time. Uh, I'm sorry that there are a few questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, I'll just uh, release those so that people can see what they were. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker again uh, for a really, very really interesting talk. And I'd especially like to thank all of the members of the audience uh, for their participation and for the great questions and comments we've gotten. So thanks again um, and have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming, appreciate it.